Have you ever discovered hidden details and jokes in a show over 12 years after it ended? That's me. That's me with Avatar The Last Airbender, because a lot of people have clearly worked very hard on this show, and I am here to expose their underappreciated efforts. Anyway, no long introduction this time. If you missed my video on Avatar Book 1, go watch it to hear my thoughts on whether it handles its cultural inspirations in a respectful way. Or short summary here. I personally think it was respectful for its time, but they could have hired more Asian and Inuit people in prominent voice acting and production positions. And the fandom shouldn't overly praise it in the representation front when it's fantasy that takes huge creative liberties and never th set out to represent real cultures. But this is also my personal opinion and others may feel differently. These videos aren't meant to be an authoritative guide, but a fun scavenger hunt from the perspective of one single Chinese person. Which also means that the potential references I talk in detail about will skew Chinese. I won't make it clear though which inspirations are confirmed by official sources and which are my personal speculations. Anyway, let's begin! Book 2, Episode 1. The gang has won the battle at the Northern Water Tribe, but now Aang faces a dilemma. Is there a point to mastering all the elements when he gets to summon the power of the Avatar State and charge right at Fire Lord Ozai? General Fong will force him to confront this. His design gives me strong Three Kingdom vibes, probably because this type of hat appears a lot in Three Kingdom adaptations. He wants Aang to go fight the Fire Lord right away, which is understandable because General Fong has been personally fighting on the front lines, so of course he wants this war to end as soon as possible. Technically, if Aang were as ruthless as Zaheer, he could just bend the breath out of Ozai's lungs and kill him. But the Avatar writers were not allowed to be that hardcore back then, so they advocated for practice, study, and discipline instead. This is definitely something you see more in Eastern stories than Western. Speaking of very general terms here, Eastern stories tend to make their protagonists obtain their incredible abilities through hard work more often than getting granted by it by being the chosen one or whatever. Though of course stories are no longer made in a cultural vacuum. Like Avatar itself is a mix of both. Aang is a chosen one, but he still has to work hard for his abilities. Side note, I once had someone yell at me because they saw a dragon spinning fire in a Chinese movie when they heard me say that Chinese dragons are creatures of water. Well, yes, traditionally they're creatures of water, but Western influence is a thing. Creators can play around with their own cultures. Just understand that whenever I talk about East versus West differences, there are always exceptions because of their influences on each other. I'm only pointing out general vibes and trends, so like, please do not take the things I say that literally and that rigidly. Anyway, because there are people dying, Aang, he decides to go through with General Fong's plans to trigger the Avatar state. The art book says that every Earth Kingdom base has a shaman who has a special connection to the Earth and the spirits. No, not sure how in tune this one is. And then the Kyoshi books by F.C. Yi, highly recommend them by the way, further explains that the Earth Kingdom also has earthbending masters called sages who have a lot of influence over Earth Kingdom politics. Though by Kyoshi's time, they had become very corrupt and detached from spirituality. The vessels in the background of this temple remind me of Chinese bronze dings. So I can't be sure if this is an influence because they still look pretty different. After several failed attempts to trigger the Avatar state, Aang decides that he just can't go into it unless he's in mortal danger. And so General Foam puts him in mortal danger. I haven't talked about Sokka's boomerang yet, so here. Boomerangs were a weapon originally used by Aboriginal Australians, which fits with the Water Tribe's general inspiration from indigenous cultures. When Aang proves harder to attack than expected, General Fong puts Katara in mortal danger instead. He gets what he wanted, Aang goes into the Avatar state, but starts causing uncontrolled destruction. Then Roku whisks Aang off and warns him that the Avatar cycle itself would end if he's killed in the Avatar state. A much needed nerf so the audience would shut up about why he doesn't use it more often. And also an excuse for the gang to move on. Meanwhile, on Zuko and Uncle Iroh's end, they've apparently drifted for weeks and finally found a Fire Nation spa. Fire Nation architecture seems to be influenced by not only Chinese and Japanese architecture, but Thai buildings as well. Though according to Avatar Extras, this resort used to be a retreat for Earth Kingdom monks. But we have seen that the Fire Nation is committed to staying on brand whenever they conquer a place, so remodeling cannot be ruled out. Zuko may have been so tired at the end of last season that he just gave up and lied down, but it's not stopping him from starting the new season brooding under cherry blossoms, which is a common motif in Japanese media. And Benos to them, Azula is popping in in a palakin. This is a type of transportation method common in ancient Asia, which is when you're carried around in a litter by a bunch of servants. Okay, about this, maybe you should worry less about the tides, who have already made up their mind about killing you, and worry more about me, who's still mulling it over, moment. It's iconic, 
but I don't think it's really as badass as people think it is. You can't fight the tides unless you're a waterbender. It's honestly pure luck that the ship didn't sink and everyone on board didn't die, just because Azula's so gassed up and detached from reality that she thinks she can fight the ocean. Though that's not without precedent in this show. My point is, this is one of those moments that appears badass on the surface, but if you think deeper about it, it really reveals that she's unreasonable and delusional. And here is the first appearance of Lo and Lee, Azula's firebending teachers. Though apparently they're not firebenders themselves, which is an interesting choice on the monarchy's part. Lo and Lee must be really good at the stances and forms then. Azula somehow tracks now Zuko and Iroh and pops in on them. I find it hilarious that Zuko gets so offended when Azula calls him Zuzu when you know, he could call her that too. Imagine them just like calling each other Zuzu in an infinite loop. That's what the Fire Nation royal family gets for using too many Zeds of their names. But Azula goes on to deliver some precise psychological strikes to Zuko, saying that their dad finally wants him back. Iroh of course sees through the lie, but Zuko wants his dad's approval so badly that he goes with Azula anyway. And her plan actually would have worked if this one guy didn't blur out the truth. Apparently, the writers originally had her vaporize him on the spot, but decided that that was too dark. I'm sure we can all perfectly imagine that happening, though. Zuko and Iroh barely managed to escape with Iroh showing off his lightning rear direction skills, and they cut off their top knots. In official Avatar canon, as explained in the Kyoshi books, the top knot is a symbol of honor in the Fire Nation, and cutting it off represents renouncing your honor or social status. This is probably inspired by how in ancient East Asia, haircuts were a big deal. Because according to traditional Confucian beliefs, you are not supposed to cut your hair. It's a gift from your parents. So when it does happen, it tends to be for some very dramatic reasons, like renouncing your material life to become a monk, or even just being a form of symbolic execution. The writing on Zuko's dagger says lettuce. <laughs> no, it means never give up without a fight. <laughs> and the writing on him and uncle's wanted poster says, The Fire Lord orders the arrest of Iroh and Zuko, two traitors. General Iroh was once the Dragon of the West. Prince Zuko was once the heir to the Fire Lord. These two rejected Imperial orders and refused to battle the Water Tribe barbarians and capture the Avatar. Kill on sight. The Chinese word for barbarian used here, manzi, is especially evocative because it's one of many terms that were historically used by Han Chinese rulers to justify the subjugation of minority peoples. And it's very telling to the Fire Nation's attitude of superiority. And then we go to episode 2, The Cave of Two Lovers. The place where Aang and Katara are training is pretty clearly inspired by the Elephant Trunk Hill in Guiling, or the Water Moon Cave, because at night, the moon's reflection can be seen under the arch. And then of course, here come the Avatar world hippies. The gang dismisses the hippies at first, but then they keep getting attacked by the Fire Nation's projectile while trying to travel by air, so they decide to follow the hippies into the SECRET TUNNEL! SECRET TUNNEL! These statues are probably influenced by the guardian statues in East Asian Buddhist temples. They're called the two generals Heng and Ha in China, or Neil Guardians in Japanese. Meanwhile, Uncle Iroh is so devoted to tea that he's made tea out of a poisonous bush on the off chance that it might be a rare bush that makes delicious tea instead. Now he needs urgent medical attention. The character above the clinic just says Doctor. Song is based on one of the Avatar character designers, and she's wearing a hanbok, a type of Korean traditional clothing. The other dude in the clinic is getting treated by fire cupping. This is a practice in traditional Chinese medicine where you light a fire inside a glass cup and then stick it onto someone's skin. The fire burns up all the oxygen inside the cup, and then the negative pressure forms an airtight seal between the cup and the person's flesh. This reportedly sucks their blood to the surface of their skin, and therefore dislodges stagnant blood and chi to cure stuff like colds and pneumonia. It can leave some pretty scary looking bruises though. Is it actually effective? I can't comment on that. I'm not a doctor. I never ended up getting my medical degree because I decided to write books instead. And in the background, there's also a traditional medicine cabinet. All those little drawers would have a type of medicinal herb inside, and they would help you build holistic wellness over a long-term period. Song graciously invites Zuko and Iroh for roast duck. Her house is directly modeled after a building that the Avatar creators Brian and Michael took a picture of on a trip to Beijing. The art book says that they went to an architecture park where there were a collection of different traditional buildings from various eras and ethnicities. Isn't it wild how there are a bunch of random buildings out there in Beijing that have just ended up in Avatar by pure chance? So after dinner, Son tries to bond with Zuko over Fire Nation trauma, as teenagers in this show do. But Zuko is still in the middle of his character arc, and so he betrays her kindness by stealing her family's ostrich horse. Ugh, the things hot people get away with. 
Meanwhile, in the secret tunnel, the gang has gotten separated by a cave-in, but Aang and Katara have stumbled upon the tomb of Oma and Shu. Their story is written in seal script, which is like 2,000 years old, to show how ancient the story is. There's a flashback done in the style of traditional inkbrush paintings, which is super cool. This is the character for war. And this story is clearly inspired by Romeo and Juliet, though it's much cooler because earthbending is involved. Oma and Shu being the first humans to learn earthbending seems to contradict the Avatar 1 stuff in Legend of Korra, though I think the continuity still works if you interpret this as they were the first to learn earthbending from badger moles, because before that earthbending was given by lion turtles. Also extreme side note, but I'm pretty sure the protagonist of Guilty Crown is named after Oma and Shu. Maybe there was an Avatar fan on the production team? Anyway, after seeing a carving of the two lovers kissing with a seal script inscription of Love is brightest in the dark, Katara gets the idea that they might find a way out if she and Aang kissed. Aang awkwardly tries to hide how utterly stoked he is, which pisses Katara off, but I'm pretty sure they actually kissed here. I mean, Aang's reaction afterward? That smile? What happens in the secret tunnels stay in the secret tunnels. Then they meet up with Sokka again and part with the hippies, and they're all excited to go back to Omashu so Bumi can teach Aang earthbending. But, plot twist, the city has fallen to the Fire Nation. That brings us to episode 3, Return to Omashu. The Kyoshi books reveal that the real disease that killed this masked guard's cousin is called Septopox. Also, the guards give some very good and very relevant advice. Meanwhile, Azula coerces Tai Li into forming a squad with her, establishing that her friendships are mainly based on fear. And here's something you might not have noticed. This circus that Tai Li is performing at is the same one that Appa will get sold to. The whole reason they're gonna buy Appa is because they'll be missing a star attraction after Tai Li leaves. Back in Omashu, the gang has run into the resistance, but Aang convinces them that, you know what, they're better off escaping and regrouping. So they make all the citizens pretend to get COVID, I mean, pentapox, and so the governor, May's dad, freaks out and orders them all expelled from the city. Can't believe the Fire Nation handles epidemics better than many modern countries. But after the citizens make it out, they realize that Momo has somehow kidnapped May's baby brother. Here, the note that May's dad sends was not translated to its full hilarity in the show. It says, Pathetic kidnappers. I am willing to trade your lowly king, Boomy, for my son, Tom Tom. Meet you for the exchange at noon under the statue of the city's summit. When the gang gets there, they discover Azula and her posse instead, and that Boomy has been imprisoned in a metal case, which would not pose a problem for him if he were tough. Aang tries to rescue Bumi, but Bumi reveals that he got himself captured on purpose because he's practicing neutral Jin. Jin, as defined by Bumi and Aang here, is not a real concept in martial arts. It's an Avatar original that's probably inspired by Jing, a term that translates to, like, force or strength, as in the amount of force you can use to push someone to the ground. In the end, Aang decides to leave Bumi there and find another earthbending master who really listens to the earth, though not before returning Tom Tom to his parents. Aang's too nice. I would have kept the kid until they gave a promise. Proper ransom. And then it's episode 4, The Swamp. The cart that passes Zuko and Iroh as they beg for money is labeled Happy Traveler's Opera Trope. It also shows you how Zuko's blue spirit mask is an Earth Kingdom opera mask. As I've said in my book 1 video, the mask is inspired by a Dragon King Nuo mask, which is a type of ancient ritual dance mask, but the rest of the masks here are inspired by the face paints in Chinese operas instead. In those operas, face paint colors represent certain qualities, like white symbolizes deceptiveness, Red symbolizes loyalty, green symbolizes aggressiveness, and so on. So when a character walks on the stage, you can immediately tell what kind of character they're supposed to be. The patterns of these face paints are called lianpu, literally face charts, or face book. Meanwhile, the gang has crash-landed into a swamp after Aang heard it calling to him. This swamp actually contains the third grade water tribe, the Louisiana Swamp Benders. They're descended from waterbenders who moved away from the South Pole. Can you imagine if Korra was born here instead? Legend of Korra would be a very different show. <laughs> anyway, the swamp gives the gang hallucinations, with Sokka seeing Yue, and Katara seeing her mother, and Aang seeing a foreshadowing of Toph. She's wearing a Ruqing, a type of robe that's heavily associated with the prosperous Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty was all about that flowy, ethereal aesthetic. Also, Chubby was beautiful back then. The gang eventually runs into Hu, who can bend plant matter like he's piloting a mecha. 
He tells them that he achieved enlightenment under the banyan grove tree that the whole swamp is connected to. Avatar extras confirm that this is a reference to how Buddha achieved enlightenment under a Bodhi tree. Then the swamp benders capture Appa, giving us a <laughs> foreshadowing of what will happen to him in the desert. The gang manages to save him this time, though, once the Swamp Benders realize that Katara and Sokka are kin! Meanwhile, Zuko gets himself a new pair of broadswords from a swordsman who made Iroh dance for a gold coin. Iroh himself was pretty chill about it, though. I mean, when you're truly confident and self-assured, you don't care about what other people think of you. Pride is an illusion. Now, episode 5, Avatar Day. Avatar Extra says the Rough Rhinos are named after Theodore Roosevelt's Rough Riders, and they're kind of like the Navy Seals of the Fire Nation. Also, their leader apparently served under Iroh in the army. While running from them, the gang stumbles upon a village celebrating an Avatar Day festival. Aang is very self-satisfied, until he discovers that it's an Avatar Haters festival. Because Kiyoshi apparently killed the village's homegrown tyrant, Chin the Great, several hundred years ago. This is obviously a reference to Qing Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. Qin is just another romanization of Qing. Also, Qin the Great's name is literally written as Emperor Qing in seal script, the actual script that the first emperor spread across China. The people of the Qin village are wearing hats and hairstyles inspired by the Tang Dynasty styles, though. It's Tang hats that tend to have the two droopy flaps in the back. Aang agrees to stand trial because that's how much of a goody-goody he is, and so he gets thrown in jail and made to wear a pillory, which is like the go-to imprisoning device in Chinese dramas. Is your Chinese drama protagonist even suffering if they're not being paraded through the streets with a pillory on? To clear Aang's name, Sokka and Katara decide to conduct their own investigation. Sokka puts on a hat that's probably meant to reference famous Chinese detectives like Detective D and Judge Bao, but they're from the Tang and Son era, while the hat that Sokka is wearing is the Ming Dynasty style instead, with the short and straight flaps. As I've said, a Tang Dynasty hat would have droopy flaps instead, and a Song Dynasty hat would be straight and very long. Fun fact, the Song Dynasty hat was actually designed by its founding emperor Zhao Kuangying, so his officials couldn't whisper to each other during state meetings. Zhao Kuangying invented social distancing. Meanwhile, Zuko robs a rich person. Is this what rich people do? Just sit in their carriages and stare greedily at their money? Can't relate. But Zuko, the former one percenter, robs the current one percenter like Reddit robbing Wall Street. And we support him. Yeah! Back on Katara and Sokka's end, they've decided to visit Kiyoshi Island again to find clues. Apparently this elder of the island is called Oyaji, which is uh, an affectionate way of saying old man in Japanese. He takes them to a shrine of Kiyoshi's belongings and actually uses the word kimono to refer to her robes. Ah, uh, to have your culture be so recognizable in the West that you don't have to translate terms. On this painting, the writing says Avatar Kiyoshi on this day split and created Kiyoshi Island. May our people and culture forever be isolated from the tyranny of the world. Katara and Sokka discover that the angle of the sun on the painting gives Kiyoshi an alibi and they rush their findings back to the Chin village. But turns out the court system there is not as fair and evidence-based as they thought. Which also applies to our world. This is a departure from the actual Qin state, which took its laws very seriously. I mean, Qin has historically had a very bad reputation of being very draconian, but some actual laws dug up from the era in recent decades have revealed that they were very meticulous and detailed. Like, there's a difference of punishment between picking a lock, getting caught in the middle of picking a lock, and failing to pick a lock and then running away. And they were very strict. I mean, stealing one mulberry leaf lands you 30 days of hard labor. Anyway, the gang goes through a bunch of effort to try and prove Kiyoshi's innocence, only for Kiyoshi to pop up spiritually in the end like, yeah, I did it. I did it because he was a tyrant. It doesn't even matter that it was an accident. I'd do it again. On purpose. In the flashback, Chin the Conqueror is wearing a Tongtian Guan, a type of hat that emperors actually wore more often than the beaded headdresses that they're usually depicted with. But modern sea dramas don't show emperors with it very often, because it's so associated with famous officials like Zhuge Liang of the Three Kingdoms fame. The flashback reveals that Kiyoshi had physically separated the Kiyoshi Island from the mainland with her incredible earthbending. In the Kiyoshi novels, it's actually a plot point that she can bend whole land masses but struggles with tiny rocks. Anyway, Aang is found guilty and sentenced to be boiled alive. But just before that happens, the rough rhinos show up again and the mayor suddenly does a 180 in his attitude. Aang saves the village, but not before roasting the hell out of them. And he claimed he wasn't gonna firebend again. Then it's episode 6, The Blind Bandit. Oh, I know you guys were waiting for this one. 
The flyer that gets handed to the gang says, Master Yu's Earthbending Academy, best in the country, guaranteed mastery. Then the back says, with this flyer, your first lesson is free. All you need to do is buy a high quality uniform. So it's not free then. Never trust discounts. The plaque above the academy just says, Master Yu's Earthbending Academy. Though if this were actually set in ancient East Asia, the characters would go from right to left instead. The DVD commentary says this academy is a parody of those shady martial arts schools that care more about making money than teaching you actual stuff. And you can tell by the way Master Yu tries to sell his students belt promotions. Those belt ranks are so shady. I say as a red belt in Taekwondo. <laughs> Then, to get more information about an earthbending tournament that they overheard about, Katara reveals that she has gotten much more savage this season. You can really see her get comfortable with her water bending across the episodes. It's great. So, Earth Rumble 6 is clearly a parody of wrestling. I mean, the boulder. <laughs> Avatar extras say that they actually tried to get The Rock to voice him, but The Rock was too busy being The Rock, so they got The Rock's friend Mike Foley to voice him instead. Fire Nation Man is a parody of how some heel wrestlers used to pretend to be Soviet Russian. He even speaks in a Russian accent. During the intermissions, the sign-holding lady is wearing a chipao, a type of dress that was popularized in 1920s Shanghai, intentionally meant to be sexy and bold after centuries of conservative women's clothing. I love that this show was so dedicated to the Asian aesthetic that they even knew to choose the sexiest traditional clothing for sign-holding ladies. After a bunch of fights, Toph shows up at last. She easily defeats the rock. I mean, the boulder, but gets caught off guard by Aang's airbending and leaves in a fury. The gang goes back to the Earthbending Academy to find more information on her, and so comes the iconic moment. Water tribe. The gang finds Toph's family because Aang saw a flying boar in his swamp vision. This emblem foreshadows how Toph eventually becomes a cop. Here, you can see Top's fancy ruching more clearly. Her high bun is also super Tang Dynasty. They were all about big hair, but her mom's hair is even more Tang Dynasty. It mimics the shape of a peony, which was a super popular flower in that era. Also, the musical theme of the Beifong family is the Chinese folk song, The Jasmine Flower. You can hear it playing whenever the Beifongs come up in the plot. Here, Top's dad is drinking from a gaiwan, a little cup that was invented during the Ming Dynasty for more refined control during tea brewing. The large opening lets you see the leaves as they brew, and the cup is glazed so it doesn't absorb flavors, and you can use the cup to brew multiple types of tea without the flavors cross-contaminating each other. Later in the night, Toph chills out and makes amends with Aang, but then they get kidnapped. The ransom note says, If you want to see your daughter alive again in this life, bring 500 gold bars to the arena. Signed, large chunk of rock, I mean the boulder, and Xing Fu. At the arena, Toph finally reveals her true earthbending powers to her parents. Instead of Hongar, she uses a completely different martial art, the Southern Praying Mantis style. It uses strong stances, but more quick hand movements than kicks. The art book says that it was reportedly invented by a blind woman, but I've checked both English and Chinese sources and could not confirm this. Instead of being impressed though, her parents just think they've spoiled her with too much freedom and become determined to restrict her further in the house. But Toph sneaks out anyway and lies to the gang about her parents' changing their minds. Classic Toph. The gold pieces that Toph's parents offer Xingfu and Master Yu are in the shape of Yuan Bao, another iconic form of Chinese currency. They were made of gold or silver, and their value was determined by weight and purity. Now, episode 7, Zuko Alone. This episode is Avatar's take on a western. Previously, he parted ways with Iroh because he was just too angsty, and it's very hard to keep being angsty when you're around Uncle Iroh. Zuko almost robs two travelers, but changes his mind when he realizes that the woman is pregnant. This is the same couple that the gang will help cross the Serpent's Pass. The flashbacks in this episode reveal that Uncle Iroh had written very giddily about the Siege of Ba Sing Se. Iroh, no! <laughs> Honestly, though, I like that Iroh himself wasn't immune to the Fire Nation's conditioning. It's clear here that he's always had his fun personality, and the part where he pretended to slay the last two dragons to keep them safe presumably happened before the siege, so he's always had a noble side to him. But still, he invaded the Earth Kingdom willingly and eagerly. He didn't conceptualize the full scope of the horror he was bringing down until his own son died in battle. I think this is why he connects to Zuko so much. He can see that Zuko is also someone 
someone who struggles with the Fire Nation ideals that he grew up with. Plus, let's not forget that Iroh was complacent in the war up until the end of Season 1. Like, Iroh was even fine with invading the Northern Water Tribe. It was only when Zhao went after the moon that he snapped. So Uncle Iroh has had his own character arc going on all of this time. In another flashback, after Iroh's son died, Zuko and Azula overheard Ozai using this to argue that he should be the heir instead. But it just made Azulon really mad. Zuko ran away at this point, but Azula stayed and apparently heard that Azulon was going to make Ozai kill Zuko so that he would also feel the pain of losing a firstborn son. The sequel comics confirmed that she was telling the truth. Azulon did actually order this. The whole reason Ursa disappeared was because she killed Azulon. She was raised as a master herbalist and knew how to make a colorless, odorless, and untraceable poison to kill someone, but Ozai made her leave the palace after assassinating Azalon so that she would never get the chance to use the poison on him. As for what happened to her after that... It's complicated, go read the comics. <laughs> During Azalon's funeral, the royal family can be seen wearing white, which is the color of mourning in many Asian cultures. Then episode 8, The Chase. I like that Katara and Toph are having a personality clash, and you can kind of see both sides. It was a little disingenuous for Katara to go up to Toph apologizing, only to be mad when Toph didn't apologize back. Though it is also true that Toph could have done the courtesy of helping out. It is so funny to me that the gang is losing it out of exhaustion, but Azula and her posse, who have presumably also been awake this entire chase, are totally fine. They are ready. They are high off the excitement of pursuit. The gang is so frazzled that even Aang blows up when Toph suggests that Alpha's shedding is what's leading Azula to them. I'm with Sokka on this. They were jerks to Toph. Aang fakes a trail of Alpha's fur to lead Azula away, while Toph runs into Uncle Iroh, who's been giving Zuko space, but secretly following him to make sure that he's okay. Aww. Finally, the entire gang plus Zuko and Iroh converge in a small abandoned town and corner Azula. Avatar extras say that the town was a mining town named Tu Zin and abandoned because there were no more minerals to mine. A little detail here that I'm not sure all of you noticed, the reason that Iroh got hit with Azula's lightning is because he was distracted and surprised to see Toph among the gang. Azula clocked the opening instantly and used it to escape. The fight was 6 on 1 and she still got out of it unscathed. Iconic, honestly. Sadly, Uncle Iroh fell in the process and Zuko won't even let the gang help. And that brings us to episode 9, Bitter Work. This title is a loose translation of Kung Fu. Kung Fu doesn't strictly mean martial arts in Chinese. It's not even like the most commonly used term for it, which would be Wu Shu. It really just means to put in work in general, or you can even refer to the passage of time. Uncle Iroh dreams of his son Lutin, and then how he buried Lutin near Ba Sing Se. We'll see this place again, and it will make us cry. After he wakes up, Zuko asks him to teach him more advanced firebending skills so he can stand a better chance against Azula. Zuko was ready to hear Iroh convince him to just get along with Azula, but then Iroh drops yet another iconic line. Now, I've seen people say that Iroh was wrong to say this because Azula is just a 14 year old and more in need of his guidance than Zuko, but there's a fundamental difference between Azula and Zuko. She has power while he doesn't. And when she's in that position of unchecked power, she's not going to be accepting any guidance. Iroh knows this better than anyone else. I mean, he didn't even have a personality as ruthless as hers, yet he didn't think to question his attitude toward war until he suffered the personal loss of his son. You need to be taken down a peg to have the capacity to change. So I don't think Iroh is advocating for Zuko to straight up kill Azula, but for him to check her power and not worry or hesitate just because she's family. Family members can be toxic. Sometimes you don't have to forgive them or maintain ties with them, especially if they're racist. To teach Zuko advanced firebending, Uncle Iroh basically explains the concept of qi. But what's super interesting here is when he says that the ability to separate negative yin qi from positive yang qi is what can let a firebender create lightning. In real life, lightning is created by an imbalance of positive and negative ions between a storm cloud and the ground. So there is science behind lightning bending. I love it when the mechanisms of a magic system has an explanation that makes perfect sense within its world building. Despite Iroh's science lesson, however, Zuko still can't do it, and so he gets very angsty about it, as per usual. So then Iroh switches gears to teaching Zuko lightning redirection instead, because, well, if he can't generate lightning, he still has to prevent himself from getting killed by Azula's lightning. This draws on techniques that Iroh learned from waterbenders because he is wise and open-minded like that. He goes on to explain that you must let the lightning pass through your stomach, not your heart. The Sea of Qi he's talking about here refers to the Dantian, or more specifically the Lower Dantian, a reservoir of Qi and other vital energy in traditional Chinese medicine. Zuko absorbs this information and then wants to try it himself right away. 
Iroh is like, no, I will not shoot lightning at you. So Zuko runs off and finds a thunderstorm on his own. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the storm doesn't strike him either. On the gang's end, Top's first attempt at teaching Aang earthbending isn't going that well either. She tries to taunt him into doing it while he tries to meditate to ignore her. He utters the syllable um, a secret sound in many Indian religions. It's considered the ultimate mantra, the entire universe condensed into one sound. Or so I think. Feel free to correct me on this. Meanwhile, Sokka has gotten himself stuck in a crack in the ground. Avatar extras say this was inspired by Tom Hanks in the Money Pit. When Sokka almost gets attacked by a saber-toothed moose lion, Aang manages to stand his ground against the beast, finally acting like an earthbender. He even stands up to Toph, which was even more impressive, and thus he unlocks earthbending, a much more productive study session than Zuko's. Then episode 10, The Library. The drink the guy makes in the Misty Palms Oasis bar actually looks incredible. In the bar, the gang runs into Professor Zay, an anthropologist at Basing Zay University. Him whipping out a head measuring device makes him border on one of those weird anthropologists of the 19th century who did more harm than good to the cultures they studied. But ultimately, I have more reasons to like them than dislike him. Wan Shiton's library is possibly modeled after both the Taj Mahal and the Hagia Sophia. And by the way, the Suwan Desert just means death desert in Chinese. Foreshadowing here. Ugh. Toph champions audiobooks. She must have been so happy when the radio was invented by Korra's time. More foreshadowing. Oh god. Can't confirm, this is what his name means. Avatar extras say that Sokka contributes a knot because the men of the Southern Water Tribe have to know how to tie many different knots for sailing purposes. Foreshadowing again. But not about Appa being taken this time, and something that will only come to fruition near the end of the series. Damn. Okay, here they actually did some major world building when it came to the Avatar world calendar. This slip of paper says, in the Pager era, in the year of the dragon, on the ninth day of the seventh month, it was the darkest day in Fire Nation history. History. So there was an actual date on it. And in case you don't know what era names are, let me explain. There's special names used to keep track of years, and they started in Imperial China before spreading to other Asian countries. But it can be a really confusing system because they're dependent on the specific monarch of each country, and those monarchs can pretty much change them on a whim because something really great or something really bad happened. So the system by nature cannot be universal. Most countries have abolished them because they've abolished their monarchies, including China itself, but Japan still uses them. You may have heard a while back that they changed the era name from Heisei to Reiwa with the new emperor. On the calendar wheel the gang finds, there are 16 era names and they are scarily detailed. Here's a screenshot from the Avatar wiki of loose translations of them. They're basically just auspicious sounding terms, but what's notable is that the first character in each has a radical that corresponds to one of the four elements, and they repeat in an air, water, earth, fire pattern. The era that the show takes place in is Yangwu, which has an air radical, so it's possible that each avatar gets their own era name. But it's unclear if these era names are set in a repeating pattern, which is not how era names work, you have to make a brand new one each time, or if the wheel magically updates whenever a new one is added. And and who's in charge of deciding the new one? We can only speculate. But yeah, the day of the black sun that happens in book 3 actually has a precise date. The Yangwu era, year of the monkey, the first day of the 8th month. And here's something else incredible. Toph held the library from sinking while they checked at least 4 months worth of dates. She cannot be held responsible for Appa getting kidnapped. As the gang finally flees the library, Professor Zay chooses to stay. I'm pretty sure you can see his skeleton in Legend of Korra. That is dedication. But after the gang makes it out, they're met with a reality that Appa has been captured. And so it's episode 11, The Desert. Aang is so distraught that he immediately blames Toph. Four months of dates. Aang, we're all devastated that Appa is gone, but still! Then Sokka drinks the iconic cactus juice and starts hallucinating, which is a real side effect of some cacti water. Many of them are also poisonous. When you're stuck in the desert, you should not drink from a cactus. At this point, Katara is single-handedly holding the entire team together. Seriously, they would have all died without her. Meanwhile, Zuko and Uncle Iroh have also arrived at the Oasis Bar. There, Iroh uses a secret Paisho code to communicate with a fellow Order of the White Lotus member. Paisho seems to be based on a bunch of different board games, like Chinese Chess, Go, and Chinese Checkers. Even though Chinese Checkers is not Chinese at all, it was invented in Germany. <laughs> 
The Order of the White Lotus is possibly named after the White Lotus Society in Chinese history, though they were pretty different. The White Lotus Society wasn't about sharing knowledge across state lines, but it was a secret religious movement that was like part Buddhism and part Taoism. They first started about a thousand years ago in the Song Dynasty, and they were just a normal religious sect back then, and they believed that the Maitreya Buddha would eventually reincarnate again and bring light to the mortal realm. But then, after the Mongols came and established the Yuan Dynasty, the White Lotus Society became experts at organizing rebellions. They also started worshipping a bunch of other deities like the Venerable and Born Mother, but the common focus was on plotting rebellions during their late night incense burning sessions. The founder of the Ming Dynasty, Zhu Yuanzhang, even rose in association with the White Lotus, but after he became emperor he tried to ban it. That didn't stop them though. They continued rebelling throughout the Ming Dynasty and then the subsequent Qin Dynasty, and the worse societal conditions were, the more they flared up. It got to the point where every time an emperor heard that the White Lotus was stirring up in a certain region, he was like, oh my god! I guess this kind of ties into how the White Lotus eventually helped kick the Fire Nation out of the Earth Kingdom though. Here, this sand sailor Toph stumbles into is later revealed to have been buried by Appa. And if Appa hadn't done it, the gang would have been trapped in the desert indefinitely. So, he got them out of the desert after all. Avatar extras say that in Sandbender lore, the Siwang rock was dropped from the sky by the gods to prove their power. Or it was a meteorite. Saka could have gotten his sword early. And oh man, Aang bursting into the Avatar state when they run into the Sandbenders? Relatable, honestly. I love this superpower berserk mode trope. Pre-order my book if you like it too. It's in there. Pacific Rim meets The Handmaid's Tale meets China's only female emperor. Buy links at ironwidow.com. And I love how Katara isn't even afraid here. She's just sad. <sighs> With that, we go to episode 12, The Serpent's Pass. The gang runs into the refugees Zuko decided not to rob, Jed runs into Zuko, the gang runs into Suki, and the cabbage guy runs into devastation again! Amazing! Everyone's converging in Ba Sing Se! After our extras say, Full Moon Bay was inspired by Half Moon Bay in California. This stamp says rejected, while Toph's passport says Earth Kingdom First Class Passport, Toph Bay Fong. Bay Fong means the northern direction, by the way. Not sure if that's meant to symbolize anything. After hearing that the Zuku alone refugees had all their stuff stolen, Aang decides to lead them through the dangerous Serpent's Pass, or Coiling Serpent's Pass, as the writing here actually says. This type of gate is called a Pai Fang, an iconic gate structure in Chinese architecture for whatever symbolic gates are needed. Aang and Katara parting the water here is obviously a Moses reference, though the gang also whips out two other ways to cross the water. The serpent itself looks like a vaporwave Gyarados. And originally originally appeared in the unaired pilot of this show, and the production team brought the design back for this episode. Here, I'm pretty sure this is the first hint that Toph has a crush on Sokka. I kind of like that it didn't go anywhere though, because I don't like it when a fictional friend group entirely subdivides into romantic couples. This is why I didn't ship Joey and Phoebe and friends. Not that I ship Ross and Rachel either. Anyway, the group makes it out of the pass unscathed, but now the baby's coming! Katara demonstrates yet again why she is the glue holding everything together. The baby comes out successfully, and her parents name her Hope, and even Aang is happy again, but then they see the drill that the machinist designed coming right for Ba Sing Se's walls. Which leads into episode 13, The Drill. Aang shows the Karens of the world what really calls for asking for the manager. However, this manager insists that Ba Sing Se is the penetrable city. Its name possibly comes from the Cantonese for unbreakable city, though the Chinese characters chosen for it mean forever sturdy city instead, and are read nothing close to Ba Sing Se in either Mandarin or Cantonese. The manager sends the elite terror team to go against the drill, but they get single-handedly taken down by Tai Li and her chi blocking. I freak out too, I just hand the city to her. Also, her chi blocking is likely inspired by a real type of kung fu, dian xue, where you strike your opponent's pressure points. I mean, ever been punched in the solar plexus? Meanwhile, Zuko and Uncle Iroh have arrived at the Basing Se station. This isn't mentioned in the show, but they actually use a family name on their passports, Hong. The same character that's in Honggar, the martial art that inspired earthbending. This probably isn't the real family name of the Fire Nation Royals though, if they even have one. Jet tries to get Zuko to join his freedom fighters for real, but Zuko refuses to further social interaction. Then Jet spots Uncle Iroh drinking steaming tea that he was complaining was cold just a moment ago. And so Jet activates conspiracy mode. 
Honestly, we clown on Jet a lot for this, but when he lives in a world where firebending exists, his suspicions were perfectly plausible. Especially when he was right. Back at the drill, the gang has compromised it from the inside, while the Baxing Se soldiers are just randomly chucking rocks at it. I swear, teenagers are carrying this entire war. And by the way, the Royal Earth Kingdom Guard uniforms are clearly designed after Qing Dynasty armor. Finally, the gang combines their efforts at the front and back to overload the drill with its own slurry, making a very interesting shot. But anyway, this shot of Baxing Se from the inside makes it clear that its walls are inspired by the Great Wall of China. And then it's episode 14, City of Walls and Secrets. The art book says Judy's design and personality was based on their line producer, Micken Wong. I wonder how she feels about this. And as I've mentioned in my book one video, Ba Sing Se appears to have heavy influences from China's final two dynasties, Ming and Qing. Most men in the city wear their hair in queues, which is a long braid down their back. This is the traditional male hairstyle of the Manchu people, rulers of the Qing dynasty. Professor Ze also wore his hair like this. Though in the Qing dynasty, you actually had to shave the like the whole front part of your head. <laughs> then the Earth Kingdom royal palace is like basically a copy and paste of the Forbidden City, which was built 600 years ago in the Ming dynasty and used during the Qing as well. The type of hat that the Dai Li are wearing seem to be modeled after the hats that Qing Dynasty officials wore in the summer. The concept of the Dai Li is probably inspired by the Jing Yi Wei, the royal secret police during the Ming Dynasty, established by its founding emperor Zhu Yuanzhang. Legend has it that surveillance was so intense that Zhu Yuanzhang was once talking with an official and was like, hey, so what were you up to last night? And the official replied, well, I had some dinner with some friends. Oh really? Which friends? What were you eating? The official replied honestly, and then Zhu Yuanzhang, very satisfied, pulled out a drawing of his exact dinner party seating arrangement and everyone there. Which of course freaked the official out because he had no idea that he was even being watched. So yeah, it was very hard for any of Zhu Yuanzhang's officials to be up to any White Lotus activity, but it did not stop them from trying. The name Dai Li itself might come from the name of the head of the Secret Service of the Chinese Nationalist Party, which was in charge of the Republic of China after the Qing Dynasty fell. Like, Dai Li was the actual dude's name. And see, more cues here! And I've also explained in my book one video that this type of high collared and straight buttoned vest is derived from Manchu writing wear. The people in the background are wearing Changshan, another type of clothing that developed during the Qing Dynasty. And here's an example of inspiration derived from Manchu women's fashion. The gowns they're wearing are qi pao, but the original Manchu qi pao, not the sexy 1920s kind. The headpiece is called a qi tou, usually decorated with flowers and tassels. The headpieces worn by the women, like the ticket agent and Judy, are likely also inspired by qi tou. Here, the sign says Mr. Bao's Tea House. Katar and Toph successfully infiltrate the Earth King's party, but get stuck under the supervision of Long Feng. Or Long Fang, I guess. Gotta pronounce it the white way. Ugh. His name might mean Dragon Phoenix or Dragon Wind? Meanwhile, Jet finally confronts Zuko and Iroh about being firebenders and gets into a fight with Zuko. To this day, I don't know who is more hardcore. Uncle Iroh risking it all for tea when he's being wanted by both the Fire Nation and the Earth Kingdom, or Jet, for following this suspicion through until he got arrested. Whew. Back at the party, Aang accidentally spills water all over a noblewoman. He airbends her dry instead of just water bending it off her. Airbender instincts, I guess? He also does a trick that has the potential to be very insanitary. I hope he didn't put that combined water back in the cups. Here we get a first look at the Earth King. He is clearly inspired by Puyi, the last emperor of China. I mean, the glasses and the Qing Dynasty emperor gear? Come on. So they had characters inspired by both the first and last emperors of China this season. The king's name, Kui, can mean either chief or puppet in Chinese, depending on which character you use. So it's a pun. Avatar extras say he took the throne at age 4, which is pretty similar to Puyi taking the throne at 2. Then both of them were cooped up in the palace until they were forcibly kicked out. They were also fed very distorted realities. Kui had no idea that there was a war happening, and Puyi had no idea his regents had dissolved the entire Qing dynasty on his behalf, and China had actually become a republic, uh, kind of, beyond the palace. Seriously, he thought he was still emperor for like several years after his dynasty was overthrown, because they still let him and his staff live in the palace. There is no republic in the Forbidden City. Then after he got kicked out, he became a puppet of the invading Japanese in the puppet regime they established in Manchuria. His life was pretty tragic, he just kept on getting used by different political entities to push their own agenda. Though apparently he was pretty terrible and sadistic sometimes, so you don't need to feel that bad for him. He was probably also gay. 
Or at least on the very gay leading side of bisexual. I mean, on his wedding night, he married two women at once, an empress and a consort, but then he fled the wedding bed instead of consummating the marriages. And the two women were like, then this censorship of all talk of conflict by the Dai Li mirrors modern China. The CCP calls it preserving harmony. Harmonization has now become slang on the Chinese internet for censorship. Seriously, it can get so wild. You never know when a post of yours is gonna trip a censorship filter. But as I've said in the book one video, you can't stop people from side eyeing. To the gang's horror though, a whole different Judy appears. Then they dally inside the city for like a month because the next episode is the surprisingly good The Tales of Ba Sing Se. I say surprise surprisingly good because it was mostly written by a bunch of staff members who aren't writers. They bring a different perspective. I like the slice of life format because it showed a bunch of things that we don't typically get to see, like a first confirmation that Aang actually has to shave every day to remain bald, and that Toph is susceptible to feeling self-conscious about her appearance. I know the story that got us all was Uncle Iroh's though. While he is gearing up to destroy us, he's plucking a pea pot, which I have described in my book one video. Then the lawn instruments in the background are guzhen or zithers. He helps a string of people in Ba Sing Se, even a mugger who held him very poorly at knife point. But then he returns to his son Lu Ten's grave. The writing on Lu Ten's portrait says, General Iroh, see you when we obtain victory. Signed, your loyal son, Lu Ten. So this isn't a commemorative portrait, actually. It's a selfie that Lu Ten sent Iroh? Whatever, I'm too devastated to care. This scene hits extra hard because Iroh isn't just crying out of grief, he's also crying out of guilt. It was him who led the siege on Ba Sing Se, and he didn't realize what the war was doing to ordinary families until he lost Lu Ten himself. Consequences, man. And then after the tale ends, it hits you with a dedication that reveals that Iroh's voice actor Mako, one of the most legendary Asian actors in the West, had passed away during production. Mako from Legend of Korra was later named after him. Rest in peace, sir. After that emotional roller coaster, Sokka's tale revolves around haikus, which is a form of Japanese poetry that's supposed to be in a five syllable, seven syllable, and then five syllable format. The poetry instructor, Madame Macmulin, is inspired by the writer Lauren Macmullen. Then in Zuko's tale, it is amazing that Jin smooshed Zuko in the end after all the nonsense he put her through. I don't care if he's the future Fire Lord, I would have gotten up and ghosted him the moment he started yelling. He knows what he did. Alright, I gotta start a poll though. What was worse, Uncle Iroh exposing his firebending to heat his tea, or Zuko exposing his firebending to impress a girl? Reply in the comments. Then we get to an even more devastating episode, Appa's Lost Days. Honestly, I'm suing this episode for emotional trauma. But I'm about to deliver more trauma to all of you because look at this. Imagine how much it shaved to get dragged across the desert like that. Then Appa gets sold to Tai Li's old circus and abused and dressed up like a dancing lion. Then, my god, all the stuff he goes through. The writers, why did you do this? Why did you feel me to do this? In the Eastern Air Temple that Appa eventually gets to, he runs into Guru Patik. The art book says that the Northern and Southern Air Temples used to be run by monks, while the Western and Eastern Temples were run by nuns. Guru Patik attaches a note for Aang to Appa's horn, and Appa eventually makes it to Ba Sing Se, but the Dai Li gets to him before he can get to Aang. And that brings us to episode 17, Lake Laogai. The poster the gang made says, Searching for a flying sky bison, name Appa, has six legs, weighs ten tons. If you have any info, please contact Avatar Aang in the Upper Ring 96th District, building 217. So the address was right there, yet after Zuko got a copy of the poster, he was like, he could have just shown up in the middle of the night in a sneak attack, yet he resorted to going through the trouble to go find Appa. Was he planning on using Appa as a hostage or something? Who knows? Probably not even Zuko himself. <laughs> Laogai itself is a real term. It's short for Reform Through Labor in Mandarin, which is a horrible forced labor camp system in China. They say it's meant to reform criminals, but many of the criminals who end up there are just political dissidents or religious minorities. They're made to do basically slave labor in terrible conditions. Brainwashing was also a real aspect. Prisoners will be made to listen to and repeat propaganda about how great the 
Communist Party was for hours on end. And none of this is a thing of the past, it's still going on, especially in Xinjiang, where they're locking Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities up and making them do slave labor like picking cotton. Watch out for the shills in the comments who are gonna try to deny this. Stop denying an ongoing genocide when there are so many first-hand accounts of not only this, but forced sterilizations and family separations. When your only counter evidence comes from China's state media, you might want to reconsider its legitimacy. See, if I said this in China, I'd get harmonized. I still might the next time I go back. It doesn't even matter that most people in China can't even go on YouTube without a VPN and see this video. So if I suddenly disappear from all social media after a trip to China, you know what happened to me. Anyway, Zuko pulls a body substitution jutsu to capture a Dai Li agent and get info about Appa, while Jet breaks through his brainwashing and leads the gang to Lake Laogai. Then Long Fang kills him. Like, actually. <laughs> The creators confirmed it in multiple sources. Then episode 18, The Earth King. Yes, he and the last emperor Pui have indeed both been through many conspiracies aimed to control them. And like Kuei though, Pui was born outside the palace, but given that he was dragged inside when he was two, he probably had no memories of the outside world. He didn't even see his mother again until he was nine, and he'd forgotten her, his, her face by that point. His first conscious venture outside the palace was, I believe, an escape attempt when he was 16, like right before his wedding. Given that Kuei was never shown with a queen, I would bet that he's a teenager here as well. Through some effort, the gang successfully convinces Kuei that the war is real and that Long Fang is a traitor. And then a search of Long Fang's offices turns up a bunch of letters and documents that temporarily compels the gang to split apart. It's like they've never seen a horror movie! Well, you know, well they haven't, I guess. Not until Varric comes and invents them. Here, Sokka's probably thinking of fugu. You know, those fish that people insist on trying to eat, even though it could be deadly if done wrong? Humans are so weird. Then we get the canon cursed image of Airbender Zuko that I must make all of you see again. Then it turns out Azula and her posse have stolen the Kyoshi Warriors' identities, and the real horror movie begins. <laughs> Episode 19, The Guru. Juke is rice boiled overnight until it breaks down into a starchy paste, and then it's usually garnished with toppings. Chakras are a real concept that originated in India, but they've gotten so muddled by Western New Age beliefs that like, I tried to research them and I couldn't even tell what was actually written by ancient Indian philosophers and what was written by white people in like 1990. What I'm pretty sure about is that they're meant to be focal points for meditation because they're considered centers of spiritual energy. Also, there were many different chakra systems beyond the commonly known seven chakra one. And a lot of associations with the seven chakra system, like the seven colors, were mostly invented by New Age white people. And I should know that chakras are not the same as the traditional Chinese medicine system of qi and meridians. Avatar invented its own system of chakras that's approximately based on the seven chakra one. So there's no such thing as the light chakra or sound chakra in real meditation practices. Anyway, if you know more about chakras than this, please leave a comment. Oh, and very fun fact here, the calligraphy in Uncle Iroh's tea shop says, I'd rather go three days without eating than one day without tea. <laughs> Such dedication. Tov has a subplot where she gets captured by Master Yu and Xing Fu and then events metal bending, changing the bending game forever. <laughs> it's unknown if anyone actually ended up finding Master Yu and Xing Fu, so there's a distinct possibility that they just died here in this cage. Suffocating. Lovely. Now, finally, the season finale, the crossroads of destiny. Having captured Katara and Zuko, Azula is now plotting a coup. A coup is the sudden, unconstitutional overthrow of a government. In the dungeons, Katara and Zuko successfully bond over Fire Nation trauma. Can you imagine if she actually used up the spirit water to heal his scar and Aang bit the dust because of it? It would be tragic, but it would also be really funny. <laughs> Meanwhile, Azula pulls off the coup. The entire Fire Nation couldn't take Ba Sing Se in over a hundred years, and yet she just snuck in and took it down from the inside in a matter of days. And even psychologically manipulated the Dai Li and Zuko into joining her. God damn. You know, some might not understand why the Dai Li ended up betraying Long Fang in the end. I think at this point, they saw that the Earth Kingdom was a lost cause and that joining the Fire Nation was their only chance of survival. Thankfully, Katara did not use the spirit water on Zuko's scar, so she brings Aang back from the brink of death. But the Earth Kingdom has officially fallen, Aang is still unconscious, Iroh has been imprisoned as a traitor, and Zuko and Azula are now on the same side. <sighs> Seriously though, this is one of the best season finales 
ever. In writing, there's a concept of using a three-act structure, and at the end of Act 2, the protagonist is supposed to be brought to their lowest point. This was one hell of a low point. A story is not exciting unless your antagonist is competent, you know. Anyway, that was my deep dive on Avatar Season 2. Now on to personal news in the long while since my season one video. Yes, my book actually is available for pre-order now. If you haven't heard of it, it's a Pacific Rim meets The Handmaid's Tale polyamorous reimagining of China's only female emperor, Wu Zetian. It's officially coming out September 21st from Penguin Random House. And if you pre-order now, you might be able to get exclusive annotations after its release where I explain all my historical and cultural inspirations. So like doing one of my videos, but for my own book. I'm not exactly sure like what format the annotations are gonna take yet though, I I still have to work it out with my publisher. But anyway, you can pre-order it at ironwidow.com. I swear the cover is being finalized, so it should be revealed soon. This book and its sequel will also be translated into French, Italian, Spanish, and German, and another foreign territory I can't talk about yet. But this also isn't going to be my only published series! I can finally announce my second book deal, Zachary Yin and the Dragon Emperor. It's a middle grade series that's like Chinese Percy Jackson meets Yu-Gi-Oh! It's about a Chinese-American diaspora kid who's like not really connected to his heritage, but then the first emperor of China possesses his AR gaming headset and sends him on a journey across China to heist real artifacts and fight figures from Chinese history and mythology. So the perfect book to get into Chinese history and myth through a fun adventure. Add this book on Goodreads and sign up on my website to hear major news about it. It's releasing summer 2022, hopefully, from Simon & Schuster. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you've learned something new. If you want to see more videos from me, like a deep dive on Avatar Season 3, or Kung Fu Panda, or Mulan 2, please consider supporting me on Patreon or tipping me on Ko-fi. You'll get updates about where I am with the videos instead of waiting in the void, and you'll be able to suggest and vote on future topics. Also, also, I made a Discord server. Go to my Patreon to find out how to join. And that ends my hour of rambling. Thanks again for the amazing support and for watching, and I will see you next time.